what, what I'd like to talk about first is a, is a hobby uh, of mine. Um, shake that thing, miss. Can I, can I shake that thing, miss? And I better shake that thing, yeah. Da, 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 da. Jordi and Rebecca, woman, get busy. Just shake that booty non-stop when the beat drop. Just keep swinging it, get sticky. Get drunk, stop percolate. Anything you want, because it's hostility. If I don't take pity, you want to see you get life on the rhythm of my ride. I'm a lyrics up about electric city. Yeah, nobody can do you nothing, cause you don't know your destiny. Now sex the ladies who are part with us, and now they care with us, and now why with us. You know the club that... So... <clears throat> Now, so in March of 2001, I filmed myself dancing to Madonna's Justify My Love, the, the Orbit remix, actually. And I took those clips and I cut them into small film loops and I put them uh, online in a, in a site called How to Dance Properly. Now, this was intended as a birthday invitation uh, for my 28th birthday. And I sent it out to 17 of my closest friends. Now, that was on a Thursday. By the following Monday, over a million people were coming to this site a day. Right? So at this point, I'm getting emails at a rate 200 times, 200 emails every time I check my messages. Right? I get a call from my credit card company asking me whether they, they, you know, it's okay to authorize a $30,000 bill from my internet service provider for an overage charge of 10 cents per megabyte over my limit. Right? I haven't slept in four days and my friends are like, just shut it down. Just shut it down. People were finally noticing me. I was part of the internet apostles, like the weird guy that dresses up like Peter Pan. <laughs> you know? Shut it down. Well, needless to say, with all that uh, 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 fame and attention, I, I was able to uh, quit my job and uh, <clears throat> finally become freelance. Uh, <laughs> now, over the next five years, I. Uh, I developed this, uh, this uh, project called zayfrank.com, uh, over 125 projects, all of them brilliant. Uh, and people refer to me as a web uh, guru, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Swami, maybe this, the, the young kids say, I, I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> but the, the truth was is that I had distilled what makes a website popular. It's too complicated for all of you, but uh, <laughs> if you want, maybe later we can, uh, we can talk in private. Uh, it takes about a half hour or so. Um, but I really think of the site as a collaboration between myself and the audience. I receive a lot of emails. And I, I feel like it's, it's about finding inspiration in novel and interesting ways, you know? For example, I got this email here. It said, hey, Zay, if you ever come out to Boulder, that's in the United States, uh, you should rock out with us, you know? I said, sure. And then I received this. It said, hey, Zay, thanks for rocking out, but I meant the kind of rocking out where we'd be naked. And that was very embarrassing, of course. <clears throat> Someone said, can you make a talking frog for me? And then I received this. <laughs> Okay, so that was a 25 minute long video from Brazil of people playing with the frog. Now, it's, it's pretty amazing for people that makes things in the, in the sort of online space because we rarely get to see our audience actually uh, interacting with, with the stuff that we do. Um, and and I, was, I was sort of like, wow, it's sort of like there's a, this international performance art going on, you know? And so I created this, this, this little uh, a, a toy with that in mind. <clears throat> uh. <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> Somebody said, can you make a dancing puppet for me? Now I know what you're saying. Zay, I want to make a dancing puppet. How's it done? Well, I prepared this for you. It's basically a Jacobian matrix. Um, which, uh, which is actually can be hacked by using a law of cosines, which is a, technically a, you know, a little bit of a workaround, but it works. Now for gravity, it's just torque equals RF sine theta. And uh, so I think we're on the same sort of uh, page, right? 
Uh, one of the things that I, I, I did early on in the site was to develop these little uh, mini Photoshop type apps. So these are little uh, drawing toys uh, that you, uh, you can play with in a browser. And, and some, some interesting stuff happened. Uh, people sent me some pr uh, pretty wild stuff with this sort of overly simplified tool. This little pointillist piece was sort of one of my favorites. Uh, but the thing is, is that this kind of an application rewards people who are good at drawing. Uh, and, and, and the people who aren't good at drawing draw pictures of penises. <laughs> now, that's not really the kind of site that I wanted to run. Uh, so th my, my first sort of attempt uh, to uh, deal with this was kind of passive aggressive. I created this. Um, <clears throat> this is a little thing where you can doodle and anything you, you doodle it turns it into a penis. I, uh, I just thought I'd make it easier for them so they could just kind of, you know, do it. Uh, <clears throat> But then I, I, I thought I'd, I'd try to get a little bit more creative uh, with this kind of thing. This, this, this tool here is called uh, the, the Scribbler. And basically what, what it allows you to do is uh, draw some crappy uh, drawing. And then when you're done drawing, it, it turns it into a, a post-war German etching uh, over time. And this, this actually uh, was, was quite fun. This, uh, for example, this little uh, thing here. All these drawings, except for the, the very last one, uh, were done by kids under the age of 15. Isn't that nice? The, the scribbler actually, this is a little detour now, but I just want to show you something. I, I became really interested in this idea of potentially using generative algorithms to, to, to emulate this kind of like a really raw, rough drawing style. And it was really inspired by all these uh, little uh, sketches that were uh, sent to me. I think there's over 10,000 sketches uh, have been sent in. So this is actually an attempt to build this kind of a robot. Now, not the traffic light kind of robot that you guys do here, uh, but the, the, it's an orthogonal plotter, basically. But the, the cool thing about this is it, it's built from all these kind of crappy homemade parts like uh, McDonald's straws filled with putty, and the whole thing shakes like crazy. So there's a lot of like analog distortion in it. It's a, it's a terrible racket, uh, and you can see it there in action. And these are some of the first pencil drawings that came out of it. Uh, sort of interested in this idea of, a, of analog breakdown in this space. Uh, and just briefly with the scribbler, we also did, this is a, for a Herman Miller uh, in DC and in Chicago this live uh, scribbler that actually glazes bowls with light as you move your hand around in that, in that kind of pad space. Um, so <clears throat> this notion, so when you, when you work on something like this as a hobby, you quickly realize you don't want to make that much stuff because it's, it, it absorbs too much of your time. So one of the things that I became really interested in was a participatory projects. So projects where the consumer makes the stuff and then I get to say uh, that I made it. So this, uh, for example, um, this is uh, two projects in one. There's a whole uh, section of the site called the Fiction Project, which I'll mention in a little bit, uh, where people write poems together collaboratively. Uh, and then uh, now people are actually illustrating them with the scribbler. Uh, so here, for example, Queenie is one royal pain in the neck. Rhonda takes Prozac, but still is a wreck. And uh, we're, we're aggregating this. Uh, there's about 400 drawings so far. When there's enough of them, we're going to publish a little book uh, together uh, on the site. There's some more serious participatory projects that I've, uh, I've put together. Um, this is called When Office Supplies Attack. I ask people to send me images of themselves. Uh, you see that the one with the chair? That's actually a person attacking another person, but it was sent from France. So I gave it some leeway. Uh, this is toilet, oh, toilet paper fashion. Uh, <laughs> So the watch, it's a really, really nice stuff. I don't know what's going on with the baby, to be honest with you, but uh, I that's, don't know if I really got it. Uh, this is a newer project here, uh, haikus for a newly neutered dog. Um, this is a, a picture that a, a user sent me of their dog who had recently been uh, castrated. Uh, and that not only that, but you know, made to suffer this humiliation of the cone, which is even worse. So these are some of the uh, entries. Over 10,000 so far. <clears throat> My favorite is the toy he loves most in his mouth ready to bounce. Oh, the irony. So a lot of people say, Zay, you do all this stuff on the internet. You know, why aren't you making any money? And I say, mom, dad, <laughs> I'm trying. 
I don't know if you, if you know, but uh, the young kids are playing uh, these uh, video games, uh, and the industry's making like a thousand or two thousand dollars a year, and a lot of money. Uh, so <laughs> I decided to, to, to give it a, a shot. Uh, this is the first game that I made. <clears throat> it's called Atheist. Um, it, fully customizable, by the way. You can have your own key commands and things like that, and you can sort of jump around and move. You can even say, say things. Uh, <clears throat> So, so uh, there's a little bit of a problem with test marketing. Uh, the, 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 the kids were crying. Uh, so, what, you know, whatever. I, I, I'm not. I'm not a quitter. I uh, came back with Buddhist. Um, <laughs> now you, you can see it's fully customizable. Uh, you, you can, uh, you know, jump around, uh, uh, say things. Um, now. <clears throat> When you fall off, uh, you come at, back as a duck. Um, <laughs> now, the, the, the problem with this game, it ended up being a, a profitability issue. Uh, with one quarter, you, you play a really long time. And um, <laughs> so the investment part was a little uh, shy. But third time is a charm. Uh, this is a game called Christian, uh, fully uh, customizable. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> Any, uh... Yeah. Down, uh, yeah. That's a good, good choice. Um, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can actually wait for the second coming, which is actually a random number between one and 500 million, uh, if you want to. That's, that's, a, that's a little bit about my hobby. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I uh, do as a, as a teacher and a consultant. Uh, ground rules, uh, I'm an American, long way from home, uh, if I'm culturally inappropriate or naive. Uh, so, for example, when I say the word culture or omelet, uh, Western in front of it, right? You could just, just assume that. Uh, <clears throat> So, in particular, what I'm interested in, in, in uh, touching on here is how technology is impacting creative development. And the reason that I'm really interested in that is that there's this whole breed of, uh, of kids that are coming up that are incredibly involved with technology. They're actually doing all sorts of crazy, crazy stuff, and they don't necessarily uh, consider themselves designers. And to be honest with you, I, I question whether we have the uh, faculties uh, right now to actually teach them. Uh, so that's a, a little bit... <clears throat> what I'm interested in. This is a Donald Judd quote. Are you guys familiar with uh, this quote? No. Uh, design has to work, art doesn't. So this entire thing was, is going to be massive oversimplifications. But from, from my perspective, this is a, it's actually a, a very nice way of thinking about it. For example, we don't have the liberty of doing this, right? It works for me and that's all that matters. Right? That, that's an annoying art student kind of take, right? Uh, <laughs> Designers are people who are trained to make things work. Now, and the, and the idea is that it's not just an internal kind of sensibility, but there is some outside metric that we have to work against, right? We have to, it has to be uh, judged uh, as successful in some kind of a way, right? <clears throat> now, if, I'm just gonna take you back for one second and, and try to like figure out why it is that, that, we, uh, that we end up uh, teaching design as, as we do. So, the, the pedagogy of planning. One thing that's really interesting, if you look at it, how, how expensive it has been historically to make things for any kind of a mass market, right? The kind of a mass market that's going to dr drive a design industry, right? It's very, very high entry cost, pigment cost, uh, even in the 1960s to make a new font, to cast a new font, $600,000. Uh, to do that. If you just think about transportation costs and distribution, very, very high. So how has the design industry evolved to try to take care of that very high risk type thing? What we've done is had a very uh, cautious kind of a planning pedagogy that's gone along. We do a lot of research. We uh, move forward a little with research. We do a little maquette or a comp or something like that. Show it to somebody who ostensibly will share the blame. Uh, and, and, and when they say yes, we move on to the production phase, and the farthest we'll ever fall back uh, is to the point where we can point blame on someone else. But it's a sort of a very, uh, very cautious, evolved, um, very highly evolved uh, a thing that's, that's, that's kind of happened over time. So what happens when the entry cost drops to almost zero? So this, this to me, is the most significant thing. I know it's a very big over, oversimplification, but I am making a point here. Um, we have then and now. Great graph. 
So the entry cost drops to zero. Just think about how uh, distribution has changed, right? The, the cost of the kinds of tools uh, that, that we're working with uh, for the average person, it's completely uh, shifted the, the entire way technology and culture and, and creativity uh, work together. So what's changed? Number one, acceleration. One of the, the amazing immediate things about acceleration is how it affects the tools we use as designers, right here. Pencil, circa 1600. Pencil circa 2000, right? This is a graphical user interface uh, over, uh, over a 10 year evolution, right? It's a completely different application with totally different input mechanisms. Not only that, but things that we would consider to be pencil like, right, in its output. This, for example, is a, is a homemade application by this guy, Chris Coyne, called Context Free Design Grammar, where, see that stuff on the left hand side? He has created his own language for himself to input very, very simple text and come up with incredibly complex and elegant drawings. So even, you know, not, not, not only the, the actual tools, but the way that we uh, input related to, to what kind of output we have. The other thing that's changed, platform. The platforms that we're developing for are constantly shifting from under our feet. We don't have stable platforms anymore. What are we designing for? And not only that, but blogs are different than newspapers. They are. Cell phones are not little TVs. And the weird thing is, is that every time we go through this kind of a radical shift, we always frame the new technology in terms of the old technology, right? We screw up. This is one of the first films, King John. All they did was film a stage and do a play. When TV started, they would read newspapers on TV on the news. That's weird, right? We're doing the same thing, I promise you. Now, uh, Edison, same thing. When, it, when the telephone was invented, he, he scoffed at the idea that it would be used as a one-to-one -one, uh, mechanism. He imagined that it would be for remote broadcasting to large crowds. Right? It would be some sort of a, it's a remote megaphone. Um, and what's more, even the content and how we think about the content has shifted. This is a wonderful little diagram. That, uh, it, I often use it to describe what I call the death of narrative. But, the top graph is in a one hour episode of Dallas, the American television show, the plot relationships in one show, okay? The bottom one are the, are the plot relationships in one hour of the television show 24. The consumer, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like, I went back after I saw this. This is from a Stephen Johnson book that recently came out. I went uh, to, to this uh, museum of television and radio history, and I, I looked up that episode, the Dallas episode, because I was like, no way is that the whole thing. When they described one relationship, it would be like this. It would be like, well, you're my brother. I know I'm your brother. Mom liked you best. Yeah, bro. I mean, it was just, it was like constantly like <laughs> nailing it into you. Like, you're like, oh, yeah, I got it. You're brothers. Now it's kind of like, you know, just a tiny little mention. It's sort of like... Yeah, what'd you do last night? And you're like, oh my God, they're lovers. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, this, everything's, every, everything's shifting. So, uh, uh, also the consumer has changed, the consumers themselves, right? So, uh, Renaissance one happened, just from the perspective of the consumer, this is ridiculous that I'm trying to do this in one slide. Uh, Renaissance, one slide. Uh, <clears throat> What happened, right? The, for example, one of, the, one of the real, real fundamental shifts was that the consumer was able to uh, make their own decisions, right? Gutenberg and the press basically started Protestantism, right? It was, it was the fact that people could consume on their own terms and they could actually interpret things on their own terms, right? So that's really the birth of the, of the real consumer culture from my perspective. People are calling this the second renaissance. <laughs> Looks a little different, right? Now, there's two ways of looking at this. One is the crapacopia model. There's so much more crap to consume. That's the old, that's like framing it within the old context. The new context is there's so much more being made. All right? There's a very, very fundamental difference. People are coding their own ideas and instantiating them into some form at a greater rate than has ever happened in history. People have favorite fonts. That is totally screwed up. Verdana in the popular language? It's totally crazy, right? People know the mechanisms of authorship. They have become so much more sophisticated. They watch reality television shows, and they know they're being fucked with. And they love it, <laughs> right? 
not only that they love it, but they've started to meddle with the authorship mechanisms themselves. They edit their own stuff. They mash up the music. They, you know, everything basically uh, is, is modifiable in some way, and there's an expectation that it's modifiable. Not only that, but look at all the stuff that they're doing. Right? They're incredibly highly active. An entire encyclopedia written by users. That's amazing. And then Amazon, if you ever go on Amazon.com and, and look at the reviews, people spend half their afternoons for free giving you incredibly detailed you know, information about these books. Participation is the new currency of loyalty. It's not consumption. It's actually about activity. Right? This is, this is the, the really radical shift that's happening, right? Where it is this, uh, you know, they call it the authorship society, or the, uh, the culture of participation. And that's sort of what I really want to nail home is this notion of activity being the new, or participation slash activity as the new currency. So act two, we lose control. Think about it. The tools move way too quickly for us to learn in any way that we've always thought of it. I mean, think about it, like those poor saps that became experts in director or something like that, you know? I don't know what they're doing now. I mean, they're... We can't, we can't do that anymore. The, the platforms themselves are shifting so radically, who the hell's the expert anymore? Right, who do you learn from about cell phones or all this, this, this kind of stuff? It's becoming completely disjointed. It's totally at odds with this pedagogy of planning, of this way of teaching design in a sort of a, 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 an apprenticeship expert uh, paradigm. <clears throat> so, what do you do? Reading the hack, number one. One really interesting thing is the way that consumers are now defining what it is that is the framework of what works. Right? It used to be we say what we're trying to do, and if it fails at that thing, we just scrap it. Right? But here, this, here's an interesting example of it. Friendster, I don't know, do you guys know Friendster here? No? It's a social networking kind of thing, you know, like uh, friends of friends, or I don't know how you guys, which, which, uh, which one became popular here? Well, that's my own echo. That just freaked me out. I just heckled myself. Um, <clears throat> so Friendster was really interesting because you know their their whole thing was like we're going to show people how you know let people meet in online spaces by introducing people to friends of friends, and you have this cluster of friends, and then second order friends, third order friends, everything like that. Now, when they launched this site, uh, two interesting things happened. One is people started creating fake characters like the Hulk. And then they, you know, then, then the Hulk would meet Ralph Macchio, and they would they would give each other testimonials about like the parties that they went to last night. It was totally weird, right? And Friendster shut it down. Okay. Next thing that happens, there's all these. When you were able to add photos in the beginning, they had this little text on the bottom that said, "Friendster is not to take the place of traditional photo sharing sites." It had. It already had. I mean, the whole thing was that this had nothing to do with social networking. This application facilitated people's first websites. The entire Philippines had websites within about two months. I mean, it was incredibly radical. Uh, and they, they went online and they learned things about cropping JPEGs and stuff. This thing was about decorating a room. And that's what MySpace, another one, latched onto really, really quickly. And they have a very, very open environment. Right? So what they did is they understood, they read the hack, they saw how a technology was being used for something that was not supposed to be its primary uh, purpose, and they just adapted and moved into that space. Right? So the, the, this idea of reading the hack is about the cons like, trying to figure out how you can create a structure where you can see what is actually happening with whatever you're designing. Um, this idea of having to uh, make sure that you converse with your audience, this is a very sped up clip of a guy who figured out how to open a kryptonite lock with a Bic pen, right? He sent this around, this was about three or four years ago, he sent it around, and <clears throat> within about two days, millions of people were looking at this, and they were you know, demanding their money back from kryptonite. Kryptonite didn't say a word, they just kept their mouths shut. Within a week, their stock had dropped to the point where they were close to bankruptcy. And then they had to address it. They had a massive recall. I don't know if you know this recently, what happened with Sony with the rootkit uh, virus that they had installed in all their CDs, right? The, the audience, we, we generally think about this new viral uh, popularity stuff as positive, but it can also have a negative effect. So the, the value of being able to converse with your audience in some way, already have it in place, have conversive mechanisms in place, is incredibly value, valuable for making sure this stuff uh, holds together. I don't think that I'm running out of time. Okay, I'm gonna, these, I promise it's gonna get easier. <laughs> Fallacy of the bell curve, ready? 
we look at our audiences traditionally looking at, at this, this idea of the Galton bell curve of some kind of an average, some sort of a normative behavior that we can target. That is what target marketing is about, is, is thinking about audiences in terms of bell curves. Now, when you move into a space that's dominated by activity or more complex systems, the bell curve does not work anymore. It doesn't work at all, in fact. The curve looks like this. You might have heard of the long tail. This curve describes, for example, uh, in a message board, uh, the post count per user. You'll have one user that has a massive post count, two users that have like maybe twi uh, half as much, and then this massive, massive tail of people who post like once or twice. This, this curve also defines like natural systems. If you plotted uh, earthquake magnitude versus frequency, it would look exactly like this. This is a, an incredibly powerful naturalistic curve. So, so throw the bell curve out. So what this implies is that what we do when we create, when we design for things, what we're doing is we're cutting off, right? We're cutting off at a certain point. If a certain amount of users, you know, uh, if a certain um, aggregation of users don't use it anymore, so think about television, they'll cancel a show if it goes below a certain usership, right? What they're missing out on is this massive, massive, massive audiences that are kind of underusing it. Now, just to underscore what I'm talking about, more than half of Amazon book sales come outside of its top 130,000 titles. Think about that. That's amazing. I mean, that's a huge, huge profit uh, p potential. Rhapsody streams more songs each month beyond its top 10,000 than it does its top 10,000. I don't even know 10,000 songs. So the idea really is, you know, the, 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 this sort of new idea of design has to do with facilitating a whole range of activity. The hyper users uh, of whatever thing that you're doing that write all the articles that, you know, uh, that are always uh, playing in that space, they define the culture of the product. The long, long tail is the prof profitability. It's the sustenance. It's the core usership of the audience, right? And you want to facilitate the whole spectrum. You have, uh, I'm going to skip this. But here's the, 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 main, the main idea is this, is that you have to accommodate a, a range of activity from passive consumers, and you're not trying to move them up the curve, you're just trying to occupy a slot. And remember, there's, there's something in between passive inter and interactive. When people think about like, the interactive arts, they're, immediately they, they poo-poo this notion like, well, people don't want to interact with their television. But there's also something in between, which is activity. Remember, participation is the currency of loyalty now, right? If you can get someone to do something, even if it's just once or twice, they are affiliated with you in some way. So this notion of what, you know, how to fa facilitate activity in a minimal way is very, very important. Um, this, this is a, one example of a, of a sort of interesting space that follows these rules a little bit. This is called the fiction project. So this is where uh, people collaboratively write fiction. And what I originally envisioned was I, was I really wanted to have these novels written by uh, you know, groups of people. And I imagined them sort of like groups of five users that would, would write little novels together. So when I launched the space, the thing that I found was that people were ignoring my rules completely and coming up with their own. So I, I, I changed the space to just basically facilitate this, and there's over 30,000 projects in here now. And they define their own rules. They're, people are incredibly good at defining rule bases that I could have never thought up. Like, for example, these, using seven words only, tell me how to kill a game. So this is the seven word project. So you, you, do, you complete what somebody else suggests, and then you come up with a new seven word. Don't pass go, don't collect. Ow, mom! Seven words to tell how much you like the, the, the Zay board. Better than a poke in the eye. I thought that was good. So this is, these are, this is uh, a three word summation. Uh, so sum up something in three word. Crabs, yum, yum, yum. Crabs, genital, my minuscule pets. I thought that. Love, weather's more reliable. I like that one as well. Uh, there's uh, sudden stories. This is uh, another way like, that you can do it. I, uh, this, oh, it's, these are, this was a, a project that this person made up where you, it actually, it's about the shape of the poem, right? They, they're all supposed to for, form this sort of like triangular shape. Uh, this is another one. Poems we might have written as children. Concord. I saw Concord yesterday. It was great. It looks like a swan. I want one. <laughs> it's, 
really, really great stuff. So um, just to, to kind of uh, to pull this to a close, one of the companies that's doing some really, really interesting stuff right now in this space is Lego, where they invited 100 of their kind of like nerdiest Lego players uh, to collaborate on, on the robotics end of uh, the future of Lego. There's also this really amazing thing, filmmaking in game spaces. So a lot of game manufacturers, you know, the Xbox things, release their source code ahead of time to allow kids to mess with it to make movies in that space. And they're actually integrating that kind of movie making activity sort of things right into the technology itself. Um, so just a few little points, and then I have something very important to tell you. New designers are explorers. How do you teach courage and resourcefulness? It's a, it's a, it's a really, really big question because the idea is, uh, well, for example, I, I imagine it's, it's really about the perpetual hobbyist. And really, I'm, I'm not talking about your industries necessarily. I'm really talking about this kind of like technology and design world, but all these kids that are already doing all this stuff. But think about it, you know, <clears throat> we have this bias where we're very afraid to use a tool unless we're experts in it. But we also have this weird thing where if you do something that isn't directly related to uh, your own making money, we call it a hobby. And there's a little bit of a bias. Try spending 40 hours on something a week that doesn't make you money. See how long until your friends start asking you about it, right? So you're doing a lot of magic tricks these days. <laughs> you're gonna do a show, <laughs> magic man. Uh, just do it from rapid prototype to rapid release. This kind of, you know, this is, this is a really, really key point, is you have to get in there and do it. You have to understand the dynamics of those activity spaces to start reading the hack. You have to get your product out there, see how it gets redefined, and have some kind of a design cycle that, you know, release is just the start of it. This, you have to get into reflexivity, uh, constantly sort of modifying based on some kind of observation pattern. Instead of learning old rules in order to break them, the maxim that has carried this tradition forward forever, we have to figure out how to find new rules to follow. That's what this whole space is about. When you have all this instability, it's, I think, the only way to go. From platform-specific creative development to platform-independent creative development. If you just think about the way, like, you know, design for television is just about this box that you consume it on in your living room. Well, that box is going away. But there still has to be a way of thinking about creative development in those spaces for, you know, c consumption of traditional narrative, for example. Adverb marketing relations from information to opinion. People don't get their primary information from traditional media anymore. A lot of it is about, it's, it's about figuring out how to get opinions across that people can use to aggregate and, and explore that information. From teaching what works to teaching how to find out what works. And now, I just really want to uh, say a, something kind of more serious. Um, in our uh, personal and professional lives, we often get emails that um, upset us. You know, like this, this one I got recently. Uh, it said, Dear Zay, regarding the designs you sent, it was a good first attempt. However, your use of color and typography feels a bit childish and out of date. We'd like you to meet with our in-house designer so he can educate you on our design philosophy and show you some better alternatives he's come up with. So, <clears throat> My first response is, is, uh, is to react something like this, like, uh, Alex, um, please tell your in-house designer to shove his alternatives up your... Now, I don't end up actually sending these emails, right? Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I send something quite different. I send something like this. Alex, of course I'm perfectly willing to accommodate any changes. Let's set up a meeting with your designer ASAP. I'm sure we'll be able to figure something out. How does that sound? I look forward to working with you on this. Zay. <laughs> now this bottles up a lot of anger. <laughs> and uh, we eventually take it out on things we love, like our uh, cell phones or uh, digital cameras. Um, <clears throat> but there's an alternative. Uh, it's called passive-aggressive punctuation substitution. Now, <laughs> by associating simple phrases with the punctuation you use, you greatly expand the vocabulary at your disposal. Now, uh, for example, uh, returning to the email we just saw, it now reads, Alex, you vacuous pus bag. 
Of course, I'm perfectly willing to accommodate any changes, you minuscule twit. Let's set up a meeting with your designer ASAP or not. I'm sure we'll be able to figure something out or not. How does that sound, idiot boy? <laughs> I look forward to working with you on this piece of crap. Zay, bite me, jackass. Thank you very much. <laughs>